All right, we are recording, and now I'm going to uh, share my screen. We're jumping back into um, our theological reflection, and as we do that, um, we're looking specifically tonight uh, at the Christmas story. Remember, as we're talking about theological reflection, uh, we're just talking about reflecting on our lives in a way that we can hear God and see God and know what God is doing. Um, and so um, it's important to reflect theologically on our lives. We get so caught up in just turning the crank, just going day by day, making sure that we're maintaining all the things that we need to be maintaining in our family and work responsibilities and um, church responsibilities and all these things that are, are very important. But so many times we can get so busy maintaining that we don't actually see what's really happening in front of us. Sometimes we go through days and we get to the end of the day and we know we're frustrated about something, but we may not know what we're actually frustrated about. And theological reflection can help us with all of that. Now, specifically, theological reflection, tonight we're going to look at the Christmas story. And we all know it. We can quote it. We can tell anybody and everybody what the Christmas story is, what the true meaning of the season is, and um, that the purpose of tonight is not to, um, to teach you a new story, but perhaps to reflect on the story that we know so well to see what it can teach us where we are in our lives. Um, and I think that's a, a helpful thing with theological reflection is that it is always something that can teach us wherever we are. Um, so as we look at these familiar scriptures tonight, I encourage you to, to reflect on them. And my plan is not to really to read any of them specifically, but mainly to, to kind of go over these four different scriptures. And as we go over them, um, just kind of hit the highlights. And then, like I said, spend some time reflecting on them theologically. So that's the plan. Um, the four passages are Luke chapter 1, um, 26 to 56, Luke 2, 1 through 20, Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and then Matthew 2, and I have to move it, 2, 1 through 15. So um, looking forward to this, um, and we'll see how it goes as, as, we, as we go there. Okay, so first, Luke chapter 1, 26 to 56. Uh, this is an important part of the Christmas story, not the most traditional part of the Christmas story, but this is a um, this is when the, ga the, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. Oh, Lynn Wilkerson is joining us. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Sorry, I'm late. Hello. Just fine. We have just started, um, and okay. we're going to kind of go over these four passages, and then we're going to talk about reflecting on them theologically like we've been doing the last couple weeks. Um, Perfect. So Luke 1, verses 26 through 56, it's a big chunk, but the first big chunk is when Gabriel appears to Mary, and they have this long conversation. Um, anything that traditionally stands out to you from Mary and Gabriel's conversation. It didn't take a whole lot for her to be like, well, okay, you said it. All righty. Absolutely. That always strikes me. Um, I am the, verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Um, what a powerful phrase. Um, I love in the beginning of this passage how it connects it to Elizabeth's pregnancy and John the Baptist. Um, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Um, I just imagine what it must have been like to hear those words, to experience that. Um, you know, and to know that 
you will give birth to us, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And she's thinking that's impossible. And then of course, nothing is impossible for God. Um, so, um, what a, what a powerful, powerful section there. And then the next part of this section is when Mary visits Elizabeth. Of course, John the Baptist jumps when he hears Mary's voice. Uh, in her womb, in Elizabeth's womb, and then Mary's song, uh, the Magnificat, uh, my soul glorifies the Lord. It's just a wonderful song of worship and praise. So many wonderful things um, in this passage of scripture. Anything, I mean, we, we did this part real quick. Any other things that just kind of stand out to you from this part of the scripture? All right, well, let's leave that there. We're going to come back to it. Um, Luke 2, 1 through 20. Now, this is the traditional got to read it on Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. Um, you know, um, Caesar Augustus decreed that a census must be taken. Um, and, of course, Mary and Joseph travel in this. Um, after they travel, she gave birth and laid Jesus in a manger. What's next in our story here? Shepherds? Shepherds in the field. Angels sing a little song. <laughs> and then the shepherds go to see the child. And Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. I love those little phrases that Luke puts in there. Um, when, when they take Jesus uh, to the temple and uh, Simeon and Anna see them, Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. And other points throughout Jesus' story and through the gospel of Luke, Mary treasured up these things in her heart. Um, I love to think about that as theological reflection. Um, things that, you know, as Mary was, was trying to, to take in what she was really seeing and process that, okay? So this is our, like I said, our traditional Christmas story. Thomas, right. when I hear um, them talk with that line, Mary treasured up all the things in her heart, to me, it just makes her that much more real and human because as a mom, when you give birth, like I can tell you every moment from the time I knew it was time to go to the hospital. I mean, the, your, each child's birth story is just so special for every mom. And this particular thing, she treasured up all these things. Yes, she did because she is a mom. And that is her child. He's our Messiah, but he is her baby. And to me, it just makes it so much more like this little girl has just had a baby and she's trying to remember and soak it all in. And it's got to have been overwhelming in many ways, good ways and bad ways, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Such a great point. And I think that's right. We see the humanity there. Um, we see her humanity when the angel appears and he's like, don't be afraid. You know, I, I you know, I know this is a lot. Um, and answered her questions too. Like, I, I, you know, the fact that, you know, the angel could have just, you know, especially with Zechariah, right. Uh, in, in Luke chapter one, he says, how can this be? And he's like, you're not going to be able to talk until the baby's born, you know, but this, you know, Mary was young. Uh, Zachariah should have, you know, I mean, he should have understood and, and trusted a whole lot more. But but the fact that the angel interacts with Mary like this does make it real. And I don't know, it, it really, I don't know, it, it, it does stand out to me as well with that part. I like that. Other thoughts before we move on to Matthew? Matthew? 
All right. Now, again, we're just we're, we're hitting these things. We're going to come back to them. Matthew uh, 1, 18 through 25. Um, Joseph is worried about the news. Mary, word on the street is Mary is pregnant. And evidently, this angel appeared to her, and this is a child of God most high. Um, Joseph is a righteous man, so he's just going to divorce her quietly. But an angel appears and interrupts his plans. Um, I'll pause there. His was a good plan. You know, he didn't want to make her, uh, he didn't want to put her in danger. Um, you know, she could be stoned to death for, for, for this. He didn't want to make a big scene. He wanted to, to, to do this as easily as possible. He was a righteous man. He had a good plan. God just had a much, much greater plan that he could have never conceived of on his own. Um, and I think as human beings, we come up with a lot of good plans. As churches, uh, we can come up with a lot of good plans. Wayne, I'm sure you've seen a lot of good plans from a lot of churches that you've talked to. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a good plan, but just because it's a good plan doesn't make it a God plan. Um, and uh, we need to be paying attention to everything that God is saying. And thank goodness uh, uh, that, that Joseph was. This angel appears in a dream. And I love this phrase. Um, I always would say this with my seventh graders. The angel says, Mary, Mary, right? Take her as your wife, Mary, Mary, and name the baby Jesus. Those are the two things, you know, just do those two things. Um, God asks us to do a lot of big things, but most of the time he asks us to do one step at a time, you know, do this. Focus on this right here. Keep this course. Um, Mary, Mary, and name the baby Jesus. And Joseph did as the, as the Lord's angel had commanded him. I love how this mirrors Mary's um, obedience. Uh, Mary was faithful, and Joseph was as well. Um, and isn't it interesting that the angel appears to Mary first, you know, and she, you know, his obedience follows hers, you know? I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a neat part of the journey there. Um, all right, and that's it's an abrupt ending to this little section, but that's really um, how Matthew chapter 1 ends there is, you know, um, Joseph did it. That's what God commanded, okay? Any thoughts there before we move on to Matthew 2? All right, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 15. Now, this is, uh, we don't have a, um, well, actually, actually, chapter 1 ends with uh, the baby being born. Matthew 2, um, the wise men followed the star. Okay, so the wise men are um, not in Luke's gospel. Coincidentally, um, none of the Christmas story is in Matt Mark's gospel. Um, and then John, he just says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so John tells the Christmas story just by talking about how Jesus was the Word and the light of the world, um, a light for, for, for all people was coming into the world. Um, so... Matthew and Luke, the reason we're just looking at Matthew and Luke tonight are that they're the only two that actually have Christmas stories uh, in them. Of course, the wise men show up in Jerusalem, and King Herod and all Jerusalem were disturbed. Um, that always strikes me. Um, boy, Christmas is such a wonderful gospel such a wonderful good news such a wonderful gift but it was very disturbing uh, for the people in Jerusalem their world was being changed their understanding of what it meant to have a king of the Jews was changing right in their midst 
Um, and there was, a, there was a huge disturbance um, in their midst. King Herod asked all the, the scholars, where is this baby going to be born? And they say Bethlehem. So they send the wise men on to Bethlehem. Of course, they give gifts to Jesus. And then Joseph has another dream. And in this dream, he's told to go to Egypt uh, because uh, Herod is going to kill. Uh, the, the baby's life is in danger. Jesus' life was in danger. So flee to Egypt. Um, and, of course, we know that Herod kills all the, the children two years uh, old and younger. Of course, that's also how uh, we think it probably took the wise men about two years to get there. Judging by the time that the wise, the star appeared in the sky, um, the, um, the, that's what, you know, that was the time that, the, uh, that King Herod used to, to figure out which, which children um, uh, would need to suffer, which baby boys in Bethlehem would need to suffer uh, for that. Okay, so th thoughts there. All right, now, time for the reflection. Which character or characters of this Christmas story do you relate to most right now? So if you had to pick a character that you're like, oh, I feel like this person right now, where would you fall in this Christmas story? I think it's a shepherd. Okay, why? Uh, blue collar. Working class had the sense to hear the message and respond to the good news. Wasn't the good news, but responded to the good news and went to where Jesus was. And I love that at the end there where they returned to the fields rejoicing and worshiping yeah. God for what yeah. they had seen and heard and experienced. Yeah. That's a good that's a good word. Which one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, Nancy. <laughs> I think I identify with Elizabeth. Oh, okay. Why? Um, well, part of it, part of it is the whole mom thing. Like she, you know, she got to be a mom too. I'm feeling my age these days. That's another part of it. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I like to be associated with them people that are important. Kind of like I get the name drop, and she's like that's my cousin, you know, like that's my people. I've got this. So I like to be that. I want to be close enough where I can um, take some ownership to it, but I don't want any of the responsibility. <laughs> love it. I love it. I was going to say, I kind of feel like Jerusalem. Um, and the the reason I say that is because their lives were disturbed. Um, COVID is going on. Nothing is normal right now. Everything changes in a in a day's time. Um, you know, you're you're excited there's going to be a king, but then you're scared to death there's going to be a king. 
um, because that king might not be nice to you. You, uh, you know, it's just that fear of the unknown, what's happening, and I have no control over any of it. So. The amount of unknown. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, that's a, I didn't that's think a, I, I didn't think I could go with King Herod because I'm not royalty, but. Um, yeah, and I don't want to be that guy. Uh, you know, those are not my people. I don't want to be that people. guy either, yeah. Those are not my people. I <laughs> exactly. have nothing to do with that now. Nothing to do I with don't that. even want to name drop on that one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You've kind of got me struggling a little bit with the story because they were in Bethlehem. And then the wise men are coming from the east. Yep. It takes them maybe two years to get there. Yeah. And because of Herod's proclamation to kill any threat to the throne, Joseph gets the word to flee to Egypt. So they exit in time for Jesus not to be killed along with all the other kids under the two. But then they come back to Bethlehem. Yeah, that part is the is the why is would the, they come back to Bethlehem when they're from Galilee? Yeah, and they only went there to be counted in the first place, and it wasn't a good environment to come to uh -huh. to have to live in a barn. So why would they come back to Bethlehem for the wise men to show up in Bethlehem? Why so, would the wise men go to Galilee? So King Herod didn't issue the, the, the proclamation until after the wise men didn't come back to see him. Um, so and let's look at the, the let's look at the scripture there. Um, somebody's joining. William. I'd never really thought about that. Um, let me, uh, I, because of this, I need to move that around here. Okay. Um, Matthew 2. All right, so. It's coming on my ear. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Hello, this is. No, Tom. I mean, what? How do you? Can, can y'all hear us? Yep. William, can y'all hear us? That didn't work. <laughs> I, I, that's it, that's my dad. I He's thought, I thought, I yeah. thought, I thought that was Mr. Bill. I thought that's who yeah. that was. Okay, we're good. Okay, so let's go back to the scripture here. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where's the one? Um of course, they say, but you, Bethlehem, and land of Judah are by no means among least among the rulers. Verse 7, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen uh, when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Um, so all of that happened. Um, so, and then after that. So they left with Egypt after that. After that, that's right. So I, I, I didn't, just doing the kind of quick run through there. Okay. Um, when, when they were, didn't, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back up here in verse 12. Having been warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Um, and Joseph needed the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to travel to Egypt. That's right. 
That's right. In verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem that were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Um, so they, they probably did go back to, uh, we don't know specifically, but there's probably, um, they probably, when they came back from Egypt, went back to Galilee um, and not back to um, uh, not back to Bethlehem. That is right. Yeah. All right. Any other characters that you most relate to right now? The the thing I do love about before I ask that, the thing I love about this question too is that you could some of us may relate to Mary. Um in the unknown of hearing God's got a big plan for us, but we don't know how that's going to be. We can relate to Mary in the sense of we're trying to treasure up all these things in our heart. We can relate to Mary in, in seeking out the Elizabeths in our lives. You know, so there's a lot of different ways we can relate to Mary. And, and you know, depending on where you are in your life right now, that can change. Um, but that's the beauty of the theological reflection, right? Um, when I'm reflecting on it right now, it's saying one thing to me. Um, and then when I come back to it later, God has something else to teach me. God is inexhaustible with that. And so that's uh, some just really, I don't know, an important little phrase there um, for us to hear. All right. And if you have another character that you want to jump back in with, uh, we haven't talked about um, what it was like to be the angels. Um, kind of hard for us to relate to being an angel, but mm -hmm. to be able to share the good news with people, ever had that opportunity to feel like that? Um, to be Joseph, to make a really hard decision where you are risking a lot uh, because God's asked you to do something um, that may go against your nature, your training, everything that you, but you know, you're certain that that's what God uh, wanted for you. The wise men to go on a long journey um, and to seek God and to be, you know, not to not stop. And then to go home by a much longer route. Think about the danger that it was to go home a different way. Um, you know, when we're traveling now, I mean, travel out West, you, you, you want to take a different road home, but back then, man, I, I don't, you know, it's not like they were sightseeing and wanted to, to catch all the stuff on a different route, um, but their willingness to go a different way home uh, to pr protect the Christ child. Um, you know, all these different, different characters um, can say different things to us as we go there. Um, the next reflection question. What do you notice about the Christmas story that is significant to you right now? Well, I noticed that in looking at all the scripture, uh, as we all, we all listen to the Christmas songs every year about this time, they never change. Well, I mean, you know, some people write new ones, but all these words that we've, that we've been over in all the scripture, these words just kind of jump out, you know, like um, in all in all the songs that we hear, and we it's like we don't ever go a Christmas that we don't hear many of the songs, particularly our favorite ones that we hear. And then when you look at all this scripture, you know, you're seeing it. This is what happened back then, and um, and and everybody that writes something, uh, that writes a different song they come up with maybe a different uh, meaning for why it uh, maybe affects them. And maybe that's why they wrote the song because it, they had, it had a different meaning to them. So it's just, it's all, it just kind of, uh, I just think of all the Christmas songs that we hear every Christmas and we don't, we don't ever go without hearing them because it's like, that's just what we do. And it, you know, reminds us of, you know, what we need to think about. Mary, did you know? 
<laughs> all those all those songs are just like different vehicles for the same story, right? Right, right, exactly. And and you know, how do you get to those songs? You know, I, I mean, I think that's a theological reflection part of what is this. You know, how does this story relate to us where we are right now? Um, and the the old classics just, yeah, they. I mean, people were able to capture what that what that meant. Well, like I talked about with. I heard the bells on Christmas Day on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, he that that just captures um, so much about where he was in that moment in time. Very good. What else stands out to you about um, this story right now? There absolute obedience in every Mary's obedience um, when she discovers what's going to happen then you know Joseph had like you said he had this plan and now he's going to be obedient after he gets his his visit from the angel in his dream and then when they're told you got to pick up and move now you got to go right and say I, like, I'm not trying to leave my house um, and they just pick up this baby and go, I, I don't know how far it was, long freaking way, I can tell you that, and, and they didn't have a car, they had a donkey or a camel or something that ain't moving fast, and their feet, and they just did it, and, and they, you know, we don't know, I mean, to be sure, they were like, really, Is this what? but we don't, we don't see that, we see that they were just obedient. And, and even, as you said, obedience, too. The shepherds were obedient. The wise men were obedient. Uh, of course, the angels were obedient. Now, whether the angels have a choice of being obedient or not, I might want to get into that theological uh, discourse tonight. Um, but, yeah, obedience is obedience to God and not to, not to King Herod, right? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, being in front of a king back then and him saying now when you finish you come and talk to me and then disobeying that king um i don't you know obedience is such a crucial part of this christmas story that, that's a that's a great word uh, i hadn't considered all the ramifications of that Lilith, until you said that other thoughts about notice what do you notice about right yeah, now. What the story says to me is that God is always creating and recreating. And we're seeing that happen now. Yes. If, even because of COVID. Yep. If if you look at the uh adaptations the church churches have had to make in order to continue their witness and in a strange way, they're having more impact. I've got a pastor friend who's doing an interim in this little church that runs like 16 on Sunday, but they went on YouTube. And because they're on YouTube, he tells me all the time they had 206 views. So they're getting comments from people all up and down the East Coast that are catching their service on YouTube. Of course, I told him he needed to comb his hair three inches high and start selling prayer cloths. But... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. But, but you're but, right. And the, the book it, that it, I'm it, reading... The, the positive sides of that. And, and the fact that Atrix, for example, is exceeding its budget with nobody attending hardly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. Um, the, the book that I'm reading right now is called Canoeing the Mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about, it's a, it's a Christian leadership in, in uncharted territory, but they take uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition mm -hmm. um, and talk about how they, they were supposed to find a, water route across the country of course that does not exist 
they they figured that out when they got to the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. Um, and it was they had to adapt. Their, I mean, their mission was to get across and to to discover uh, as they went, um, and specifically to find a water route. But then they had to adapt because the the, the whole environment changed on them. Um, and so he talks a lot about uh, adaptive capability uh, mm -hmm. in this in this book. Um, and of course, if we go back right before COVID, our world was changing so fast. Even at that point, yep. um, as far as you know, living in a post-Christian world, and he wrote this book in 2015, um, talking about living in a post-Christian world and what that looks like and how churches, you know. Adapt, adaptation is 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 has got to come in in in, in certain ways. Um, I always push back a little bit when they say, you know, everything. If anybody says everything must change, that's just that's not, you know, um, realistic or helpful. Um, but I, I do think you know, listening to our purpose and our calling. Um, and reevaluating and reflecting, theological reflection on, on all that part. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, one last question. What is God trying to say to you right now? And this can be based on the Christmas story that we've talked about, or maybe just in general. Um, and this is kind of one of those, that, like that theological reflection part on your life. Um, what do you think God's trying to get your attention with right now? There's a lot of change going on and I have to get used to it. <laughs> Whether I like it or not. <laughs> um, a phrase that I read tonight or this evening. Um, I think I can probably find it real quick. Um, I underlined it. So maybe I can. People don't resist change per se; they resist loss. Hmm. Um, and you know, I think that's a. I my favorite season is the beginning of every season because I like the change of seasons. Uh, hmm. I really can't pick one season. I love the change of that. Hmm. Why? Because I'm gaining something new, and I'm losing something that I was tired of. You know, uh, May, I'm so excited about summer coming, right? And then by August, September, it's like, okay, come on, fall. <laughs> and then the beginning of winter with Christmas, you know, we're right at that. I'm, I'm, you know, let's, okay, I love getting the sweaters out and all that. And then when it's time for spring, let's go. I'm, let's roll the windows down and, and, and do that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I love that little phrase there that, um, the change isn't the real trouble. It's what am I losing? Um, you know, as I'm going. Maybe it's my perspective. I uh, maybe I better get a better perspective on things. So that might be like I like what you're saying. You know, is uh, there's going to be different things coming up, and my thing is sometimes I'm I don't know what's coming, so it scares me. So, <laughs> so I need to develop a better perspective and look at it at a different way so that's that's helpful and i think we do gain something in every season yeah um even the difficult seasons we gain connection to people um uh, i know that with you know um, i've talked to dad on the phone more over the last three months you know because it's you know he's going through a lot right now but we're sharing more conversations and those sort of things and you know i think that's you know, that's definitely a good thing. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I think, like you said, even the difficult seasons, we gain something. Um, and, and changing that perspective to, to look at what we're gaining in the middle of craziness. Other thoughts? I think he's still always trying to say, um, you aren't in control, I am in control, and I've got it. So going back to what Nancy was saying is, you know, we don't know what's happening. And right. so we've, we've just, we've got to relax and we've got to trust him 
and he knows he's got the whole picture. We only have our little teeny tiny view, but he's got the whole thing and we need to trust that he's, he's got it and we need to just let him do his job. Well, he already knows what's going to happen anyway. I remember exactly. reading where he knows what's happening and, and I read something that said, you know, okay, just leave it to him, you know, cause he, he's going to take care of it. Right. But that's hard to do. Sometimes. It's very hard to do. <laughs> very hard. <laughs> and, and that we go through those moments where like, I trust you, God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. <laughs> and, and all the while my body language, my, my tone, the way that I'm interacting with my children, uh, all those things show that I'm not actually in a trusting position. <laughs> What does trust really look like? It doesn't look like, you know, that. Trust is like the opposite of fear to me. Um, so it, you just don't see fear throughout the Christmas story, except when um, they were fleeing from Herod. And I'm still not even sure they were necessarily scared. They were aware and they knew that they had to go, but because they trusted in the Lord and, and if at that point, all that he had already done, why would you not trust him at that point? I, you know, but trust to me is just the opposite of fear. And so by that time they had totally surrendered to God's plan because like Lynn said, he sees the entire picture. So they just turned it over to him without fear. That's a great, that's a great, great word, especially where we are uh, in this wilderness wandering wherever we are right now where things are changing so fast. Um, yeah, trusting that he is going to lead us one step at a time. Other thoughts, comments? Well, I greatly appreciate y'all chiming in and, and, um, and discussing. Um, we are not planning on having anything next Wednesday night. Um, and then I, I really am I'm, I'm liking the discussion but I'm, I've got to do a lot of praying about what January is going to look like and as far as that sort of thing. But stay tuned. Um, our ABC connection that our wonderful Lynn Wilkerson sends out for us every week. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have more information. And, um, and so we'll, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to pray through whatever we do. I want it to be intentional, do it for a reason and a purpose. Um, and I still haven't settled. I'm, I'm leaning towards doing a session on David, but I'm not completely convinced on that yet either. So I've, I've got, um, God and I have a little bit of wrestling to do. Uh, he'll win. Um, um, and, um, but, but we'll, we'll let everybody know kind of where we're going on that front. So that's, that's the plan as we head forward. So if, I, if I'm feeling like we're needed to be more discussion based, we'll kind of keep it towards zoom. And if we're, you know, if just we'll see, we'll see how we go. But um, but uh, I do appreciate y'all being on here tonight. And, uh, let me say a prayer for us as we close. God, we love you. We thank you for the Christmas story, Lord, for the reminder that it still has so much to say to us. God, we we know it so well, and we know all the 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 characters uh, from the Christmas play because we've seen it so many times. And yet when we stop and, and put ourselves in the character shoes, it teaches us so much more, Father. I pray, God, as we go throughout the rest of this Christmas season, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. And, Father, that we may reflect on the things that we are taking in so that we can be a better light for you in this world. God, uh, lead us, guide us, and Help us every step along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Good Thank to see you. Good to see you. Good to see y'all. Y'all take care. Okay. Bye, guys. Good to see y'all. Right. Bye. Good to see you.